This summer, I've been focusing on ways that you can go on adventure without spending as much money as that you might have, say, a few years ago before inflation reared its ugly head. So today, we're going to be doing an episode on how to save money while you're traveling. This show is an episode I did on my companion podcast, the Adventure Travel Show podcast, The How-Tos of Adventure Travel, and it refers to also the previous episode of How to Save Money for Travel. I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes if you want to listen to that too. That one teaches you how to save the money to go on travel. Today, we're going to learn about ways that you can save money while you're actually traveling. And I encourage you to check out all the fun episodes on the Adventure Travel Show podcast. I'll put links to that in the show notes as well. They're all available on the ActiveTravelAdventures.com website, as well as on any podcast app. So with that, let's get on with the show. I hope you enjoy it. In our last episode, we focused on all the different ways that you can actually save money for travel. And we focused on ways that you could do it that works with your lifestyle and your values. So we are trying to pick the low-hanging fruit of places that were just frittering away money. And I hope you found that really helpful. And if you haven't listened to that, listen to it because it's, it's great, not just for saving for travel, but for retirement, college funds, or a new car, or whatever it is that is important to you. There's all sorts of ways that most of us are just so busy spinning plates that we don't really focus on how we're spending our money. So I think it's a very helpful episode, regardless of your financial goals. We focus on ways that you could find money in your existing budget so that you could travel or do whatever it is that you want before, but now let's go spend that money, but let's not spend it foolishly. Today, we're going to work on 69 different ways that you can save money while traveling. We're talking savings on transportation, lodging, food, entertainment, all the different things that whack away at your travel budget. There's lots of free and inexpensive and clever little ways that you can save money that are not going to put a dent in how you enjoy your trip. You're bound to find ways to save money on your future trips. Interested? Let's get started. Welcome to the Adventure Travel Show podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks, and today I'm super excited to share with you all these different ways that I found that we can save money when we're traveling. And like I said, I'm not the expert in all this stuff. I'm a great researcher, though. I know how to go out there and read and consolidate all the things I find out there on different ways for us to make our lives better. My goal with this show is to give you the tools and techniques that you need so that you can get out there and travel. And my particular instance, to adventure travel. So I focus a lot on those skills, but today we're going to focus on something that's generic to all people. We all want to save some money. So I'm going to break down. I'm not sure how long this is going to take me to do all of them. So this might end up being a two-part. We'll find out as I see how the clock goes, but let's start breaking down by category, the different ways that we can save money while we're actually out on the road. And I got a super bonus tip at the end of the program that will help you maximize your enjoyment of your trip. So be sure to stay tuned for that. The first thing is when you get to a new place or even beforehand doing a little bit of research is take advantage of the free and discounted activities that are out there. There's a lot more than we tend to think there are. Museums usually have a discounted or free day once a month. Are you able to time your trip to coordinate with that if there's something in particular you want to see? Some events even have standing tickets. And by that, I mean literally standing up. For example, you could go to the Vienna State Opera. Super expensive tickets. The main seating might cost you 150 euro. I mean, that's a lot of money. But you can snag a standing ticket right behind that same guy for about 4 euro. If you don't mind standing, huge savings and you get to see it. You are going to have to get there a little bit early and stand in line to get those tickets, but 150 versus four, that might be worth it. Don't forget to visit a lot of the churches. They're living art and history museums, and most of them are free or might ask for a donation. Be sure to check the local community calendar because the locals have things to do. It's not just for tourists. And they'll often have free events, concerts. And the better part of that, too, is that you actually get to mix with the locals. Here's a super important one. Whatever it is that you want to do at the destination, whatever those key attractions are, Facebook like them. And then you're going to be exposed to whatever the deals or whatever it is that that company posts online. That is doubly important for airlines and lodging because more and more they're shifting to advertising their special deals and flash sales only on social media and only to their friends. The second suggestion is, When you get there, 
ask the locals for suggestions on what to do. When my sister Terry and I went to Germany, one day they were going to go to the Christmas markets and we weren't into that. We wanted to do something outside. So we asked the hostess at our B&B, what does she do on the weekends? And she said, well, her favorite spot was to go on this little hike that was maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes outside of town on a bus. This wasn't in any of the guidebooks. It was our favorite day of our trip. We were on this spectacular hike. I'll try to explain to you. It was like the river carved into the mountain sideways. So we were in a a reverse C-shaped cave walking alongside this breathtaking river. We practically had the whole place to ourselves. Maybe we saw a few other Germans here and there, but it was out of a wonderland. And that remains one of my favorite days in my entire life, simply by asking the host, where do you like to go? Because remember, they're not tourists. They live there. They know everything. Take advantage of that local knowledge. Ask them their favorite restaurant. They're not going to send you to a touristy place. They're going to take you to where they and their family like to enjoy. The third thing, are there any local online savings websites? When I was in New Zealand, I found a company called bookme.co.nz. And it was like a Groupon type of a thing where I paid them about 50% to get this huge deluxe breakfast buffet at this really nice riverfront restaurant that A, I would never have even known about this restaurant. I took the bus there and then walked along the shoreline home. What a lovely way to spend the entire morning, the nice breakfast, the nice walk. And I think it set me back five bucks. So Google the, de- the destination and coupons and see what pops up. You might find something like I found in New Zealand. The fourth thing, you got to find out whether or not you want to book your activities before you go or on the ground. Most of the time, it's cheaper to book them there because when you book them ahead of time, you're often going through a middleman and paying their commissions. However, if there's something you really, really want to go to that's really popular and tickets sell out, cough up the extra money you're going all this way to get there. Make sure you see the things that you really want to see. You don't want to be disappointed. If you're not sure which way to go, check or ask on forums, a nice free way to get the information. Number five, do you belong to any special group or membership? Are you a student? Are you military? Are you a senior? Do you belong to AAA? Do you belong to AARP? Make sure you bring your ID card and your membership cards. If you're going through a group, hostels, we'll talk about that later, there's a hostel association. You get a better price if you belong to the association. Look at the fees for the the joining the group versus the savings and see if it's worth it for you to join a group. Make sure you're joining all the frequent miler accounts and frequent customer accounts for all of your airlines and your lodging. You may say, ah, I probably don't travel enough to do it, but you might be able to apply those to something else. A lot of them have alliances. So make sure you you take advantage of any special memberships that you might be entitled to. Number six, when you get on the ground, visit the local tourist information office. Oftentimes they'll have coupons or special offers and the people at the desk can really help you get insights into special attractions. Do they have a special day? Is there a special exhibit that you want to make sure you want to see? So take advantage of that local tourist office. They can be a source of not just information, but savings. If they have a tourist magazine, look in the back, see if they've got any coupons. And speaking of that, number seven, if you're driving on a road trip, you know, when you stop at the gas station, the convenience stores, they have those little hotel guides. You want to get those guides the state before you get to the state you want to spend the night. Because what they'll do is, let's say I'm heading southbound to North Carolina. So in Virginia, if I plan on spending the night in North Carolina, I need to pick up that book in Virginia because as I get close, they know you're starting to look for a hotel. Those coupons won't be for the local ones. They'll be for further down the road. So you got to outfox them and get it before you need the coupon. That way it'll be there to entice you to go to there. Once you're there, they know they don't need to give you a coupon because you're already pooped. So just keep that in mind. Grab the travel magazine, the state before you get to the state you plan on spending the night. And then also, as an aside, call to get the price and then compare it to the coupon price. See if there's a savings there, because sometimes they'll trick you there as well. Number eight, ask for a discount. People can only say no, especially if you're staying a longer time or you're staying over Sunday night. Sundays are usually vacant 
to a lot of hotels and lodging because the vacationers have gone home, but the business people are still at home as well. So nobody's really there Sunday night a lot of times. So you can often get a discount. Number nine, you got to decide whether or not to use the tourism cards. There's a lot of, when you get there, oh, buy this, the local tourist card, it'll get you into 10 museums. And you say, oh my gosh, I'll save all this money. I say, flip that. Look at the places they're going to, see which ones you actually really would like to go to and what the cost of those are, and compare that to the cost of the discount ticket. If it's close, I say pay individually because then you'll feel like, oh gosh, I already paid for the tourist card. I've got to do it. When maybe serendipity, you found your your creek like Terry and I did in Germany, you'd rather do that than go to the Ninth Museum. So weigh that out. To me, it needs to be a significant savings for that tourist card in order for me to buy it. Otherwise, because then I feel like, oh, sunk cost. I already spent the money. Now I got to go. I like to have a little bit more flexibility. So if the savings is great, do it. But if you feel like you're going to have to go to all of them just to get your money's worth, you're going to end up being frazzled. So just consider that. Okay, those are the free and the cheap things. Now let's look at food. What are the different ways we can save money on our food? The number one way is at our number 10, book a place with kitchen access or at least a refrigerator or microwave. Whenever possible, try to have at least two meals at home and splurge on the one meal that you go out on. It's nothing to pick up stuff for breakfast, whether it's yogurt or eggs or whatever it is, that cereal, whatever it is that you like to eat. And we'll get a little bit later on perhaps the lunch, if you want to pack a lunch for a picnic. And since you have the access to cook, then you can number 11, shop like a local. Go to the farmer's market, especially at the end of the day. Those guys do not want to pack up that junk. There's often some great discounts at the end of the day. And number 12, go to the local stores. Forget the tourist places. Shop the locals' grocery stores, their fish stores, their bakeries, etc. And whip up something fresh. That's a way to truly feel like you're in country when you're eating like a local. And if you see a fun-looking ingredient, you have no idea what it is or how to repair it, ask the merchant. That's a great way to have a cultural exchange. Number 13, going back to this whole thing, get a small foldable thermal bag. That way you can stick it and stick a sandwich or stick your snacks or stick whatever into your backpack. You can have a picnic on the park or in a bench. If you bring the small thermal bag, you don't have to go to a restaurant for lunch. You can eat whenever you want to. You find a pretty spot, sit down, and have lunch. Make your meals dining, not just filling your belly, like we were saying in the last episode. It should be an experience, not just, I got to do this because I'm starving. So be very strategic and when you go out to eat. Not just eating. Number 14, drink local. Whatever, wherever you are, they have a local drink. Forget the imports. Drink what they make there. Expose yourself to some of the things. Again, you're trying to experience different cultures. Drink their local beer. Do they have a special whiskey in Scotland? Whatever it is. Experiment with whatever the locals drink. You're going to save a ton of money because they don't want to pay a lot of money. So they're, whatever they make is going to be a lot cheaper than whatever they're importing. Also take advantage of your happy hours. In Iceland, the prices were breathtaking for everything. Really, really expensive. Probably my most expensive trip. But half price happy hour made it a heck of a lot more palatable for Terry and I because at least it was half of outrageous. Number 15, make sure you pack a few reusable bags in your suitcase. Lots of stores overseas charge you for your shopping bags. Plus you're saving on plastic. So make sure you stick in a couple of lightweight reusable bags. I like the kind that fold up in a little pocket so they don't take up a whole lot of room. You can stick it in your back pocket or you can stick it in your backpack or purse. Number 16, stock up on snacks. When you're at these local stores and even beforehand, before you get on the plane, stock up on some snacks so you don't have to buy at expensive stores or restaurants. This can save you a ton, particularly in airports where everything is outrageous. Number 17, along the same line, bring a reusable filtered water bottle. They've got some great options out there right now where you can drink some of the nastiest water and feel safe from pathogens and whatnot. So not only are you reducing one-time use plastic waste, you're going to save a ton of money. It's like four bucks to buy a water at the airport these days. You can empty your water bottle before you go through security and then refill it on the other side 
and you're going to save a ton of money at the airport, et cetera. Even some of the discount airlines are now charging you for simple things like water on a plane, for Pete's sake. So use your reusable water bottle throughout your trip, save a ton of money. And you know you'll always have water and you won't be dehydrated because you don't want to pay outrageous prices. Number 18, make lunch your main meal. In many places, you're going to find lunch much cheaper than dinner. So take advantage of this and have your main meal midday. Number 19, take home your leftovers. Remember, you got the fridge, right? If you can't eat everything you ordered, ask for a takeaway box. In France, where doggy bags are unusual, I once insisted on my leftovers. I had the most fabulous shrimp pasta dish I probably ever have had in my whole life. And I could only eat half of it because the portion was so large. So I asked for a box to take it away. They had no idea what I was talking about. This is not common practice over there. And so I, in my broken French and his broken English, I finally conveyed that I was taking that meal home. There's no way I was allowing that delicious thing to go in the garbage can. So bemused, the chef finally cleaned out an ice cream container for me, washed it out, and put my shrimp dish in there. Imagine I was the very first to-go box they ever did there, but I had a great meal the next day. I had a fun cultural exchange just trying to convey that that food was so fabulous, which I think the chef was secretly bemused by. And I ended up having my meal half price because I got two dinners out of it. So don't be embarrassed and don't be afraid to take home your leftovers. One more funny story about that. Jamie, my, my friend from Scotland, on my West Highland Way trip, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So the first day I get to Glasgow, I wanted to take him out for his birthday. And we go to this tapas restaurant and we way over ordered. We ordered all this stuff because we wanted to try it all and probably didn't even eat a third of it. And so again, in Europe, a lot of places, it's just not common to do doggy bags. They just don't, they just don't do it. And so I kind of embarrassed him a little bit. I said, Jamie, you're a single guy. You don't cook. We're taking this food home. And fortunately, they did have some to-go boxes at this restaurant. So we pack everything up. And then like two weeks later, when I see Jamie again at the end of my, my hike, he and his mom had come to pick me up in Fort Williams at the end of the trip. And we're heading home. We stop at a Chinese restaurant. And we again overordered. And then both the mom and Jamie said, we'd like to go boxes, please, which I thought was hysterical. So in that two week period, once they saw how fun it was and how easy it was to reheat leftovers, they had become converse to taking home the leftovers. So let's move on to number 20. Choose a non-touristy restaurant. Okay, you want to go several blocks from wherever the main hub of for the tourist center. Some call it the six block rule. You got to go at least six blocks away from that main area. Otherwise, you're either going to get tourist food, which they don't have to worry about the quality because they know you're probably never coming back and it's going to be overpriced. So not only are you going to get a better meal because they're depending on local repeat traffic if you get further away from the center, it's often much cheaper. Another tip off if you're not sure if a, a restaurant is touristy or not, if it has a really, really solid full English menu, that may indicate that it's a tourist restaurant. Not always, but it, it could, particularly in that downtown hub area, that's going to indicate it's a tourist restaurant. If you're not sure, look to see who's in the restaurant. Are they the locals or are they tourists? And if you can't tell by their face and their hairstyles and all that, then look at how they're dressed. That'll usually tell you. And take advantage of sites like Yelp and Foursquare to help you find restaurants that are good and have good reviews. If you happen to see one of those English translated menus and it's not very good, how about trying number 21? Trade a, a proper translation for a meal. If you see that that translation's lousy, offer to clean up the translation for them in exchange for a meal. Again, it doesn't hurt to ask. It costs them a lot to have it translated. The meal costs them hardly anything in exchange for the value that you're giving them. I had to do it. I didn't do it for pay. But when I was in Bhutan, there was a memo on the back door of the hotel room that did, I wish I'd taken a picture of it and perhaps I did, that it was so ridiculous of a translation. I knew what they were trying to say, but it wasn't even close. So I did write up, this is what the sign should say and left that with the front desk before I left. Number 22, this is one of my favorites, even though it scares a lot of people. Eat street and truck food. Street food and truck food. If you want to save money, rather than going to a restaurant, eat where the locals are eating. But when I eat street food, really important, 
and do a couple things. Make sure that I'm eating during the, the time that the locals are eating. So whatever their lunchtime is, whatever their dinner time is, that's when you want to eat. You want it hot and fresh. And also you want it crowded. You want the locals going there in droves. They've already kind of pre-screened everything so that you know you're going to be at a place that's got good sanitation, all that kind of stuff. Don't be the lone eater and don't eat after hours because you're liable to have a little bit of gastro problems. Another option, number 23, when comparing lodging, stay where the breakfast is included, particularly if you're getting a place without a refrigerator. And then consider what the cost of breakfast is if you go out versus the cost of of the difference in the lodging, if any. Sometimes there's not a differential, but you get a nice buffet breakfast out of it. Speaking of lodging, let's move to the next section. Lodging. Where are you going to stay? I would like to suggest that you be open to -to out-of-the-box accommodations. There's a lot of different lodging options out there now. Some of them are free or super inexpensive. And thanks to the internet... You can check the reviews to narrow down your choice, make sure you're staying with somebody good and that's and stay at a place that's good. People take the time these days. I know I do. I hope you do. When you do something, go someplace, take the time to let fellow travelers know what your experience was. It works for all of us when we do that. So anyways, looking at the reviews, you can narrow down your choices to options that are going to work for you. When you think about it, how much time are you actually in your room? When I choose my lodging, I care about three things. The location, that's first. Then I want cleanliness and safety. Sometimes privacy, depending on where I am, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. When I'm traveling solo, I tend to alternate between Airbnb and hostels. I don't do hotels that much anymore unless it's part of a tour and they book it. Those are usually little guest inns rather than uh, big hotels, but not always. But when I book it myself, I tend to do Airbnb and hostel. And this kind of gives me the best of both worlds for my particular situation. When I stay at a hostel, I get the socialization because when you're traveling solo, sometimes the only person I talk to is the ticket office. But at a hostel, I know I can go to the community room and then chat with somebody, usually find somebody to go to dinner with and also get some tips on other places to go and see. When I need a little privacy, I need to do laundry. Then I book an Airbnb apartment, either a room or a home, depending on how much privacy I want. And that gives me my quiet time and it gives me a chance to do my wash. So number 24 is consider Airbnb and vacation rentals by owner, VRBO, and other type operations. These are personal home lodgings that people like, let's say I wanted to make a little extra money, I could rent out my second bedroom. Some people rent out the whole house. I've had really great success. I've probably done this in over a dozen countries and very few hiccups at all. Usually they're funny. Nothing with the host itself. The place was was there. It was usually with one exception as advertised. And then it wasn't even that bad, just wasn't as clean as I had hoped or as private as I'd hoped. But for the most part, my experiences have been super good. And the way to do that is look at the reviews. I don't do anybody that's just starting. I use Superhost. You know, they've already been pre-vetted. They know what to do. They, they've, got, they've got the system down and they don't want to lose that Superhost status because that costs them a fortune because people like me only stay with Superhost now. I will caution you that I see that Airbnb is really ratcheting up their fees, which I don't like. So they're not going to be getting as much of my business. For example, I took my mom on a staycation last month. We stayed three nights and I thought my brother was coming. So I rented a three bedroom and really nice condo, waterfront condo. So I expected it to be nice, but it was supposed to be $100 a night. I go to checkout. The cleaning fee is 200 bucks. The Airbnb fee was 83 and then I got taxes. So I ended up spending more on the fees than I did on the room, quote unquote. And I'm seeing more and more of that. I don't like it. So hopefully they'll get enough negative feedback on that, that they'll build that in. They know the dates you're going so that the prices you see include all that stuff when you're doing your comparison shopping. So we had a lovely time, but I don't think I'd stay there again because I didn't like paying that huge cleaning fee and I just didn't have time to keep messing around trying to find something that could take my handicapped mom and my brother and all that kind of stuff. So anyhow, they're great options. Just pay attention to those fees. Now, if you're traveling in a group, you're going to find that kind of the, these hosted situations. Great. Because if you have to get multiple hotel rooms, instead of that, you could get a whole house often for much less than the hotel. Plus you're going to get a living room, a dining room, sometimes a patio or a deck. I mean, a garden. I mean, all sorts of great homes out there available to rent. 
So if you're traveling with more than a few people, definitely look at getting your own place on one of these home rental sites. But if you want to save a little bit of money, do what I do. Number 25, go to hostels. My image of hostels up until the last 10 years was, oh, a bunch of kids, they're all just backpacking and dirty, nasty, bed bugs, yucky, all that. I had a really, really negative view of those until I met these two young women that were hitchhiking in Costa Rica that were getting their master's degree. And they told me this, oh, no, it's not like that at all anymore. I didn't try it for myself until, oh, I think the first time was by accident in Iceland. So in Iceland, Terry and I wanted to go see the Northern Lights. And so you go out there and by the time you get back to downtown, it's like two o'clock in the morning. And our original plan was to take a cab and the cabbie wanted 50 bucks just to take us a few miles to our house. We're like, no, wait, we're just too cheap. We said, that's ridiculous. But we didn't want to walk at that hour either. And we were tired. And we also had a 7 a.m. tour to go, I think or this the Grand Circle tour or whatever it was. And so we were only going to be at the house for a couple hours anyway. So we decided to go to a local hostel and just crash for a couple hours. And it was lovely. So we had a nice clean room. We shared with a couple of the gals, a couple hours sleep, got up, took a shower, put back our dirty clothes because we hadn't gone back home and then went to our next tour. So that was my introduction to hostels. And it was super cheap. And so then I've experimented more and more on my travels. And there are some really, really nice hostels out there, guys. I mean, I stayed in one in, or two in Israel, they were as nice as a hotel. And a lot of them have private rooms that you can rent. Or a lot of times, if I if they don't have a private room, I'll try to get the female en suite, which means only females in the dorm room. So it'll be bunk beds, but we'll share a bathroom instead of the dorms where the bathroom's down the hall. I, I do prefer to have my bathroom in the room, but not always. Sometimes that's not an option if I want a particular location. All the rooms will have a bathroom down the hall, male or female, usually separated. Sometimes you can get a private room with or without a bathroom in the room. Sometimes you can get a same-sex dorm room en suite with a bathroom in the room. Sometimes the dorm will be mixed dorms, meaning you can have male and female in the same room. I've done it a few times and have never had an issue with it. Anyhow, it comes in all these different configurations. And so when you find the area that you're interested in, just look on the app and see what kind of rooms are available at what prices and see what you want to go with. Virtually all will have a private locker. So you need to bring a small lock so that you can lock your locker. Otherwise, they can either rent or sell you one, but just bring your own. It's just a lot simpler. And one thing I like too is, yes, it is predominantly young people, but I see people my age which is closing on 60, usually at every hostel. So I'm not all by myself. And the kids don't mind that I'm older. In fact, they kind of like talking to a quote unquote mature adult because their parents aren't there. They know they'll never see me again. So they uh, confide in me some things I think are hysterical that they would never be able to talk to their parents about. So I find that kind of fun. And even in the hostels, I've made some lifelong friends with these young kids we still keep up on Facebook. And I met up with another the last time I was in Paris. So I would encourage you to keep an open mind, try it, just book one for one night and see what you think. But, but go to a website or an app called Hostel World, or there might be other ones. That's the one I use. And they've got the ratings, read the reviews. They'll rank it by cleanliness, by location, by amenities. You know, there's all different. I mean, some of them are, are like bed and breakfasts and some of them are like a dorm situation, but they're vast variety of hostels. Try one out. Just get outside your comfort zone and see. The worst happens is you don't like it. You can go in, I don't like it. Then you lost 20 bucks, 30 bucks. But you might save a fortune if you find out like me, hey, this is a pretty good deal. And it checks a lot of my boxes of some of my problems with solo traveling. So like I said, I rotate between Airbnbs and hostels most of the time, unless I'm on a tour. There's one other benefit too, is a lot of times you can't necessarily get into your Airbnb when you'd like to, but with a hostel, Almost all of them have 24-7 reception desk and virtually all the time you can leave your luggage there even if you can't check in. So it just is easier to start your trip in a new destination at a hostel. That's what I've started doing rather than Airbnb because I know I can get in. I know I can get my luggage in there or at least I'll, I'll make sure that I book a hostel that has reception at the time I'm planning on arriving. So let's move on to other inexpensive lodging. Our number 26 is a way to get your lodging for free. Actually, I should say free to low cost. 
volunteer. You're trading your work for lodging. Some of the big organizations are really set up so it's kind of like a vacation slash volunteer effort. And so you're working and you might pay something for that, but still it's going to be a significant discount than if you were out traveling, but you are working. You're going to be helping out on a farm or doing some kind of a building project or whatever the case may be. And it seems to be like 25 hours a week or, or two days off. But I really like the idea because it's a really great way to get to know the area. But make sure on all these opportunities, read the reviews, read the reviews, read the reviews. People are going to tell you if it's good or bad. Are they trying to make you like a, a slave or do they want you to explore their culture? And this is their way to helping you to do so. Do they give you rides to town? Are any meals included? On the, the ones that you pay, usually all your meals are included. But then there's others like an a organization called World Packers. That's one that you pay for. You pay an annual fee that's modest. And then they'll connect you up with like a website that has, you put in the destination you want to go to, it'll list all the different opportunities there. Some of them are a couple of days work. Some of them can be a couple of weeks to a couple of months work that you get room for sure, often at least one meal, sometimes two, sometimes full board, depending on where it is. And But you look and you see the photos, you see what they want you to do. They want you to garden. Do they want you to help do some handyman stuff? Do they want you to do whatever? It could be housekeeping. Whatever work they need at their place of operation, you pick the the activity, pick the place and all that, and then you apply. Most of the young people I meet on my travels, this is what they're doing, and this is how they're getting to see the world. Virtually all the hostel help is volunteer help in exchange for room, sometimes full board, but usually at least one meal. You look over the listings, and you pick one that matches you, and then you apply, and hopefully you guys can come to terms, and you go and you do it. And number 27 is a little bit more specific. It's called Woofing. And Woof is an organization called Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. It's a global network that connects volunteers who want to learn about organic farming. So you end up volunteering at an organic farm in exchange for room and board. So like I said, it's very similar to the other one, except for this is a specific one, specific for those that want to learn about organic farming. Number 28 this is one I used in France. It's called Serve Us. There's Serve Us International and Serve Us US. And it's not meant to be a way to grab free lodging. Serve Us is a global organization with a mission to spread cultural awareness and understanding. And so you should go with that kind of a mindset. In fact, you apply to Serve Us. They interview you to make sure that you're a good fit. They don't want moochers. When I did my Serve Us night in France, Avignon, France, the couple met me at the train station, picked me up. Then the wife gave me a walking tour of downtown Avignon. We stopped for an ice cream, which she paid for. Then we stopped for a couple beers, which I paid for. I also had brought a hostess gift of some very fancy chocolates. Because like I said, you don't want to be a mooch. You go like you're visiting a friend. You don't just go empty handed. You try to help out. You want to have the cultural exchange. And what a great way to learn how the locals live. So not only did they make me one of their favorite local dishes for dinner that night, we sat out on this beautiful patio. They lived in a lovely ranch in the outskirts of town. And then I had a nice bath, a gorgeous comfy bed. And in the morning after breakfast, they dropped me back off at the train station and off I went. It doesn't cost me a dime. I I did have to pay for the service application, the annual fee on that. But it was just a lovely, lovely cultural exchange. And that's the whole purpose of Serve Us. Another similar organization is number 29, couch surfing, which I'm determined to try to try this on my next trip. It always made me a little bit scared about staying, but now I've done Airbnb so much. And again, there's reviews, so you get to see what people say. So it's not like you're going in on a stranger. Somebody else has pre-vetted them for you. And both hosts and guests are reviewed, just not as thoroughly. Nobody's doing the interview like they do at Serve Us. But it's a great way to hang out with locals and give you a better understanding of the culture as well. And while, yes, it's free, you don't pay for the lodging, be a good guest like serve us and bring a hostess gift, offer to buy drinks or dinner, help around the house with some chores. Don't mooch. Another inexpensive way to stay is at Mountain Huts. There's some great hut systems around this world. In New Zealand, I stayed in a lovely hut when I was doing the Angel Circuit. So on one side of the hut was just a slew of bunk beds 
And so you walked in, you picked your bed, whether up or down, and you could be sleeping next to some stranger, whatever it is. So you got to keep that in mind. But again, everybody's been hiking all day. They're all tired. And then the other side had a kitchen area where you have to bring all your gear there and then a big dining table. Oh, and I forgot a jaw dropping view. Also in, in the White Mountains in America, up in New Hampshire, when I was work, uh, walking on the Appalachian Trail with my friend Jane, we stayed in the mountain hunt system there because the weather can be so dicey. Even though we were backpacking, I wanted to make sure I was in a hut. And in those huts, they have a full kitchen where they feed you. You can buy dinner. I, no, I think it actually came with dinner. But again, you were in a dorm room. I believe it was single sex, as I recall. And it was shared bath. Lovely, lovely facilities. In Europe, there's hut systems all over the place. But these you pay for most of the time. But on the Appalachian Trail, a lot of those lean-tos, they're all free. It's first come, first serve. They're designed for through hikers. So if a through hiker comes through and you're just doing a weekend hike, you should give up your space to them if there's not space available. So the mountain huts, not only are you getting you out in the beautiful outdoors, it's a really, really inexpensive vacation. Number 31, you can avoid solo supplements. What are those? That's when you're traveling by yourself. They charge you double or stiff excess charge because they didn't rent both beds in the room. This is very common in Europe where prices are per person. Whereas in America, a lot of times it's generally one price, no matter if it's one or two people. If you want to avoid paying that supplement, choose a tour company that tries to pair you up with a same-sex roommate. And if they can't, the supplement's waived. This is yet another reason that I like active adventures out of New Zealand. That's what they did. When I did my New Zealand trip, I did not want to pay the single supplement, which was not outrageous, but if they had one. If I wanted to make sure I had my own room, I could have paid this extra amount to make sure that I did. But since I chose not to, they paired me up with Rachel out of Singapore and we got along fine. That was great. But then when I bought the North Island tour, I was the only solo female on that trip. So I got my room to myself, even though I didn't pay a single supplement. So that's the beauty of a company that tries to pair you up and it's their problem if they can't. So if you travel solo and you want to avoid that fee, look to book with tours that do that. Another option if you don't want to do that is number 32, find a travel partner. There's lots of ways now, thanks to the internet, that you can find a travel mate and have some company when you travel. There's new apps that appear all the time. I like to keep my content here evergreen. So just Google travel partner apps and see what pops up to see what the hot things are today. I will put a link to a solo traveler article that'll give you a good overview of these travel partner apps and things that you should make sure of and questions to ask before you agree to go travel with somebody. So I'll put that in the show notes. Number 33, consider a house swap or house or pet sitting. I'm going to go a little bit more detail on that later in the show. But this is how my husband and I got to spend two months in Costa Rica for free. And it's a great way to live like a local because you are in a home like a local. We had to go grocery shopping. We had to take the bus. We had to learn how to do things the way they do it down there. So it's a great, great way to get a feel for the culture. And number 34, ask for a free hotel upgrade if you are using hotel. It never hurts to ask nicely, ask nicely always and be polite for free upgrade when you check in, particularly if you've got a special occasion. Is this your 20 year anniversary and this is where you had your honeymoon? Are you on your honeymoon? Is it your birthday? If they have the room, a lot of times it doesn't make a difference to the desk clerk. Doesn't hurt to ask. So ask, is there any way you can comp me a better room or a better view? And then just hold your tongue, pause and wait to see what they say they say, no, sorry, you're right where you started anyway. What difference does it make? Ask. Might get a better room. You might get an upgrade to a higher room, a nicer view. Who knows? Ask. Now let's talk about communication. By this, I mean your cell phones and all that kind of stuff. So number 35, take advantage of free Wi-Fi. It's becoming commonplace almost everywhere in most cities and towns today. So you want to take advantage of free Wi-Fi whenever possible. And that way you don't even need to bring a SIM card for your phone. One thing I always like to do when I'm traveling internationally, if if I'm not using the SIM card, is to keep my phone in airplane mode so I'm not accidentally using data and running up my bill when I'm, when I, if, should I forget? 
And just to be on the safe side, go to your settings and turn off data so you don't surprise yourself with a huge bill. You want to make sure your apps on your phone are not using data when you travel, except for the ones that you actually need. And also, let's say you don't want to buy a coffee or whatever it is to use the business's Wi-Fi. You can sometimes stand outside a business and just check your mail or whatever it is if they have a password for your Wi-Fi. Off topic, but it's important. Don't be checking anything sensitive like your bank or anything like that on any of these public Wi-Fis and go with a virtual private network, a VPN. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. That's super important to protect your privacy and your security. Businesses aren't the only place with free Wi-Fi. You can always go to the public library. They'll usually have Wi-Fi that you can use there. I've even gone into hotels I'm not staying in, explained that I needed to check my email. Could I please have the password so I could check it real quick? And they said, fine. I've never had anybody turn me down. Oh, I take that back. When I was up at Glacier National Park in that area, they did because the Wi-Fi was so difficult up there and so expensive. So they did turn me down there. But that's the only time in all my travels when I asked somebody if I could use their Wi-Fi that they said no. And wherever you book your lodging, make sure they offer free Wi-Fi, whether it's an Airbnb, a hotel, guest house, whatever. I would make that mandatory because Wi-Fi can be really expensive if you have to buy it. Number 36, this one's important. On your phone, turn off Wi-Fi assist or make sure it's turned off. I forget what trip it was on. One of my, mm, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, I had a new phone. Went overseas. I kept everything in airplane mode, but then I would use Wi-Fi when I was in my room, whatnot, and I'd check my mail and messages a couple times a day. Wi-Fi assist, which I'd never heard of before, was in the on position with my new phone. And what it means is even if you're on Wi-Fi, if the cell company doesn't think that you have strong enough Wi-Fi power, it assists by using your data. So when I got home, I had a $246 data charge that I'd racked up during my Europe trip. And I called, I said, what are you talking about? I use Wi-Fi every single time. I did never use my data the whole time. And they explained this to me. I did complain and got my money back, but you don't want to have to even go through the hassle that I went through and they may not have given me my money back. So make sure that Wi-Fi assist is turned off. But let's say you've got to have Wi-Fi on a more regular basis. You may want to consider number 37, Wi-Fi to go. If you've got to have internet access and you don't want to have to buy something every time you need to check your email and go to a cafe and pick up a coffee or whatever, check out a pocket Wi-Fi system. And like I said, it's called Wi-Fi to go. This should be cheaper than a daily rate with your phone company. If not, number 38, if you need your phone a lot, buy a local SIM card. If you own your phone, you got to make sure your carrier unlocks it. So you got to own your phone free and clear or they won't unlock it. Then you can use a local SIM card on this unlocked phone. So when you get to your destination, you can buy this little cheap little SIM card, stick it in your phone, and then you can call and use data and all that and not worry about it. Before you go, check to see what your cell carrier phone plan is for that destination. One thing my company does, which I don't like, they do it on a calendar month and I don't usually travel on a, on a calendar month. I go in the middle of the month or whatever. So see what your options are with your current cell system because you want to have your, your game plan figured out before you ever leave. So that way you're using the best system for you for the amount of phone uses that you're going to need and at the least amount of money. So know before you go. You do not want an unpleasant surprise. Okay, it looks like we're getting a little long on this podcast. So I'm going to break it off here and we're going to go with number 40 through number 69 in when we come back in two weeks. We're going to look at ways that you can save money on shopping, on your money. How do you handle your money when you're traveling, on your transportation, how you can get some deals by being a little bit more flexible. And a couple of miscellaneous, I wasn't quite sure which category to stick them in. So we've got another ooh, 29 ways to save plus the bonus tip that'll teach you ways to spend your money to get the biggest impact on your future enjoyment of your travels. I hope you got some great ideas from the show and I hope you're looking forward to the next episode on that. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter so you don't have to take notes on all this. I have it all written down for you. You can, if you need to get it sooner, you can go to the website, adventuretravelshowpodcast.com and then go slash save on travel or just put in the search bar save and this will show up. And then you'll see the little click box that you can click and download it right away. 
And if you're on my monthly note that I say monthly, I only email you once a month and that's with freebies. All I do is send you all the free downloads and all that, maybe give you some deals or some tips or some other things that I might've found out about travel that I think that you might find helpful. So you'll get this automatically next month when the newsletter comes out. If you're listening in February, 2020, otherwise just email me at kit at active travel and I'll get you on the list and get it out to you. So this will come automatically in the newsletter. And I do hope that you do sign up for it. Like I said, I don't spam you. I don't sell your name. And it's just a conversation between you and me. And each month I just send you whatever free downloads, whether it's travel planners from the Active Travel Adventures podcast or free downloads like this checklist of ways that you can save money. I hope that you find it helpful. I do try to put some good information in there for you to make travel a bigger part of your life. So with that, I will sign off. I thank you so much for listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on. Adventure on.